talking about chapter 17 in your applied pharmacology book. It's over immunologic drugs. What do we use for the immune system? Why do we vaccinate? First question. What are some reasons that we vaccinate? We'll talk about this in class, but uh, try to remember these so you can call them out in class. But we do it to protect animals against diseases that we can help their bodies to remember. We also do it to protect um, animals around them and ourselves as humans for zoonotic diseases. Some common vaccine types that we use to produce an active immunity would be inactive, inactivated vaccines. These are used to protect against things like hepatitis A, flu, polio, or rabies. Obviously, rabies and flu are ones that we use within um, our uh, own animals. Subunit vaccines are used to protect against um, HIV disease, hepatitis B, and human papillomavirus. Nucleic acid vaccines like DNA and RNA, these are ones that are kind of in clinical tri trials. They're, they're fairly new. It's uh, manipulating DNA to look like a virus but not act like a virus. Um, live attenuated vaccines are like measles, mumps, and rubella. This would be like our distemper vaccine. Um, so this is a live attenuated vaccine. Um, and these are uh, things that we would use um, to protect against not diseases that aren't um, deadly, if you were to get it. Toxoid vaccines are using a, um, a portion of a bacterial toxin, and tetanus would be a good example of that. And then there are also recombinant vector vaccines, and this is, um, is one that is uh, fairly new. It's reworking the virus itself. Um, to look a little bit different. So Ebola is one that we use a recombinant vector vaccine. So specifically, we're going to talk about each um, different types. Inactivated are organisms that are treated most commonly by chemicals that kill the organism, but very little change occurs in the antigens. So they still stimulate a, a, a protective immunity, but they're the shell. So they're not going to create a disease. They're also referred to as killed or dead vaccines. So you're, you're basically treating with the corpse of the virus. They're very safe, typically. They're stable in so storage, and they're unlikely to cause disease through residual virulence. If you look at the diseases that we're protecting against, especially like rabies or, or polio, those are very dangerous if we were to get it, or deadly. Usually, these vaccines require repeated doses to achieve adequate protection, and those repeated doses will vary in the length of time that we give them, uh, between which we give them. They often have something called adjuvants in them. There's something that are added in the, in the vaccine to allow them to get to the tissue. Because remember, these are not living viruses, so we need to get them to the right uh, place throughout the body. These adjuvants are what can cause a severe local reaction. So if you're giving rabies to a dog, it's likely that they're going to be painful at the site of injection uh, for a couple of days afterwards or may have some alopecia or hair loss at that site. If repeated doses are required, costs could be higher. It's not true for rabies. Sometimes uh, these inactivated vaccines contain preservatives such as penicillin, streptomycin, and fungicides. So we'll see that pretty commonly throughout most of the um, medicines that we give. A live vaccine is prepared from a live microorganism or virus. These organisms could be fully virulent, meaning they're going to cause the, the, the disease, or they could be avirulent, meaning they're not really going to cause a disease. Live vaccines uh, necessitate fewer doses to achieve an immune response. Adjuvants are unnecessary, but the vaccine could contain preservatives. So there's less risk of a, an allergic response, but they are going to get a little bit of the disease. They tend to be inexpensive. Sometimes live vaccines can be contaminated with unwanted organisms, so they require careful handling. They don't tend to store as well as inactivated vaccines, and they may possess some residual virulence. 
Modified live or live attenuated uh, vaccines undergo a process called attenuation to lose their virulence so that when they're introduced to the body via inoculation, they cause an immune response instead of the disease. So if you get sick from a modified live uh, uh, vaccine, it's not that you're getting the disease, it's that your body is responding to something foreign that's entered your body. So these are effective vaccines for many viruses um, because they're, it's just attenuation of that causative virus. The immunity is comparable to the response and longevity of killed products, so not really necessarily for live products, but to killed products. They can cause abortion if given to pregnant animals. Uh, so this would be the distemper vaccine or the feline uh, distemper vaccine or panleukopenia. Um, they can cause some mild immunosuppression, some vaccines which we don't really want to see um, because we want to have the immune system really kicked up. And they, if there is any residual virulence, they could have a very mild form of the disease. Most of these do have penicillin, genomycin, thimerosal, or fungistat as a preservative. Recombinant vaccines are vaccines produced by recombinant DNA technology, and they have become more available for veterinary medicine. They're usually pretty safe, highly specific for that disease, very potent, pure, and efficacious. So they're more desirable than any other vaccine type. They have fewer adverse effects. Um, they do provide effective immunity. Type 1 and type 3 vaccines cannot refer to, revert to variants because of the way they're manufactured. And some of these vaccines can even be administered orally. There is a recombinant um, uh kettle cough uh, vaccine that can be administered orally. There are few recombinant vaccines available at this point. New technology often brings with it a higher cost. So we don't see it often, but they are becoming more prevalent in veterinary medicine. A toxoid is a vaccine that's used to produce immunity to a toxin rather than to a bacterium or a virus. The toxin is treated with heat or chemicals to destroy its damaging properties without eliminating its ability to stimulate antibody production. An aniculture, so a little culture, combines the toxoid and killed bacteria in a single dose prepared from a highly toxigenic culture and culture filtrate. So we are culturing this, this uh, bacteria to produce the toxin. Toxoids in aniculture provide protection for up to a year, so they can last for a year. Um, they usually contain adjuvants so that we can have a local allergic response, and they often contain preservatives such as phenol, thimerosal, and formaldehyde solution. So if you remember any um, uh, toxoids that we use, uh, the, the most uh, prevalent one we use is the uh, tetanus toxoid that we use with um, horses. Passive immunity. Um, Passive immunity, uh, so we're looking at vaccine types that produce passive immunity. That means offspring are getting it from mom's milk or from the placenta or through a blood transfusion. An antitoxin is a specific antiserum aimed at a toxin that contains a concentration of antibodies extracted from the blood serum or plasma of a hyperimmunized healthy animal, usually a horse. So a horse is hyperimmunized, given lots of vaccines, and then the serum is, uh, the blood is taken, and we, we concentrate that serum, extract those antibodies, uh, and we get the antitoxin. And antitoxin, so this is through passive um, immunity, uh, this is not the animal itself producing these uh, antitoxins, it's, it's another animal producing them. Uh, it neutralizes toxins produced by these microorganisms. It can contain preservatives such as thimerosal, phenol, or oxytetracycline. It produces immediate passive immunity. So if we think we have a cut that could be contaminated, we want to give the antitoxin. It only lasts about 7 to 14 days. We need to remember not to give the toxoid at the same time or even close to the other, the antitoxin, because they will, um, they will inactivate each other. So it won't help. Antiserum is a serum that contains specific antibodies extracted from this hyperimmunized animal, usually a horse, uh, it, uh, or an animal that has been infected with microorganisms that contain the antigen. 
An antiserum kills living infectious antigens. It usually contains preservatives such as phenol, thimerosal, or oxytetracycline. An antiserum produces immediate passive immunity. Um, we do not want to vaccinate within 21 days after an antiserum is given, and immunity is short-lived. Now again, this is passive immunity, which means we're not developing our own immune system against this disease. When we use plasma transfer between patients that are sick with coronavirus or have been sick with coronavirus and have developed the antibodies to coronavirus, to a sick patient, passive um, immunity to that sick patient. Now, their immune system is so depressed that they probably aren't going to develop their own immunity. Some other types of vaccines. We can use an autogenous vaccine that contains organisms isolated from an infected animal on a farm where we're seeing this disease problem, and we can uh, spin that down and then give it to, our, uh, to other animals on the farm. A mixed vaccine is also referred to as a polyvalent vaccine. We use this often in veterinary medicine. It contains a mixture of different antigens like DHLPP or uh, FVRCP, when we're talking about dog vaccines, mixture or a mixture of cat vaccines, or when we're using the uh, five-way or four-way or three-way, uh, when we're talking about mixing encephalitis vaccines uh, with horses. So you got to remember your canine vaccines, your equine vaccines, and your feline vaccines. And to be honest, I don't feel like I need to go over these uh, with you. You should review these in your book. Remember what, uh, what we're vaccinating against and what we're using to vaccinate. So for instance, if I show you a picture of an animal with a blue eye and I say, what virus causes this blue eye? You're going to say the adenovirus type 1. If I say, what kind of vaccine do we use to protect against this disease? You're going to say adenovirus type 2. So for instance, that's the kind of thing I want you to know. Also, what kind of encephalitis do we need to protect against with horses? Do we need to protect against rhinopneumonitis? Do we need to protect against herpes virus? A lot of different things. Uh, what about feline vaccines? Panleukopenia, um, FELV, FIV. You should know these things. This is all basic stuff. Swine and small ruminants, they get clostridium, C, D, and T, tetanus, clostridium, uh, cl clostridium strains, bacterial strains, C and D, and tetanus. Swine, erysipelas, and there are uh, flu, and there are a variety of other ones. The first one they tend to get is that erysipelas vaccine. So you should know these things. These are um, things you can look up in your book but you should know and understand all of those vaccines. If you have any questions, let's talk about it in class.